Welcome to the house, man. How are you? Thanks. Go. Good. Good, good How are to you? see you. Yeah. <laughs> Thurston Morris here has got the guitar uh, set up and ready to play for us. Rock and roll consciousness as opposed to music consciousness. Oh, well, it's all it's it's all music yeah. and it's all rock and roll. <laughs> it's all. That's right. <laughs> I always thought of rock and roll as encompassing everything that I'm passionate about in music, art, and life, love. It's all rock and roll. When was it the first time that you... Oh, when my brother came home in like around 63 or 64, I was born in 1958, um, so I was pretty young, and we were living in uh, South Miami, Florida, and he brought home Louie Louie, Seven Inch by the Kingsman, and, and it was, it was, that was the, the moment that I knew rock and roll was, was my salvation <laughs> and my vocation. I mean, man, you would have been six years old, five, six yeah, years yeah. old, right? But well, it was cool because he, I, I was kind of aware that there was something going on out there with like older people who had longer hair and were kind of like jumping around and, and plugging guitars in. And so as soon as my, my uh, awareness of that was happening, he comes in with this record, uh, Louie Louie, and plays it on my father's old 50s console. Mm -hmm. And um, he tells me that he made it, like oh, I made this record. <laughs> and he wasn't that, you know, he's only five years older than I is. But I was like, oh, that. I mean, I guess it's entirely possible that he would have done that. <laughs> and so he would like so open his bedroom door and sort of mouth the lyrics. But the lyrics were, you know, nobody knows the lyrics to Louie Louie really, so it could have <laughs> been anything. And uh, I was like, ah, oh, that, that's that's kind of wild. My brother made this this record, and it just sounds amazing. But. Also, I realized like that was completely impossible as well. And uh, the thing about uh, Louie Louie by the Kingsmen um, as a rock and roll record was like it had this B side that was an instrumental called Haunted Castle mm -hmm. with this really weird, like mysterioso kind of riff. And that's what really sort of stuck with me, not just sort of like that immediate, uh, you know, Louie Louie thrill, but this other kind of strangeness that was going on. So it was always, that was, that, that was always the an allure for me was like this kind of otherness in, in the music. And the rock um, and roll just didn't have to be a thing that cut on the radio. <laughs> it could be other things, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a lot of life lessons to learn in one moment. A, your brother's lying to you and not lying to you, <laughs> but maybe inspiring you. There's a lot of things that can come right. down to one day at a record. Well, it wasn't, it was, it was kind of, it, he wasn't really lying to me. He was, he was becoming, you know, he was becoming a, a, a a personality yeah. like that he was he was kind of he was cloaking himself in this thing of like wanting to be on you know be, you know be a, a, a rock and roller and I was like oh that's kind of a thing to be you know it's like you know the whole thing like when you when I got older and I was like really into you know Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and whatever and then and then by the time I was nineteen like when bands started coming in, like the Sex Pistols and the Ramones and things like this, and they all had different names. They all had they 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 created these identities. It was still them, but they created these identities to to actually sort of become more than who they were in just their real life. They're in their bedroom, and so that was really. Um, I never changed my name because I thought my name was weird enough. I used to get teased in school for having a name like Thurston. They yeah. used to call me Thirsty for more and all this kind of thing. <laughs> So I figured I already had the name. <laughs> How serious? <laughs> I had to change it so Not at much. all. I mean, Joe Strummer went through a couple of versions, right? Yeah. Uh, before he exactly. settled on yeah, Joe yeah. Strummer. Uh, Thirsty for more. That's all right. <laughs> were you scared when you were bullied as a kid? <laughs> oh, um, well, I mean, I, you know, I never really appreciated my name until punk rock. You know, it was like, oh, good. You know, having an unorth unorthodox name is, is perfect in, in a, you know, for... Uh, being in a scene where it was embracing like the alien, you know, because mm -hmm. I always felt somewhat alienated from my society of, of uh, kids I was growing up with. Everybody wanted to be competitive in sports or do this or that, and I just like I never really saw that as as a calling for me. Even though I kind of tried to sort of um, be part of that in, in that gang, and but I, I I was always attracted to like. Um, you know, the weirdos and the losers and, you know, the people sitting in the corner reading a book. And I was like, oh, that, those are my friends. And why, did you, why do you think that is? I don't know. <clears throat> you know, and it was, it was this idea of, like, why, why did subversive things attract me? Like, when everybody sort of into the Almond Brothers, why am I so attracted to, like, seeing a picture of, you know, Iggy and the Stooges, yeah. you know, with the singers spray-painted silver walking in, in, in the audience? I was like, why is that more interesting to me than than say um you know greg almond you know <laughs> you 
you know, all love to Greg Allman, but yeah. I was just like, I, I kind of want to go to the Stooges concert. That's the crazy thing about brain chemistry, right? And then you wonder how much self-control do you actually have? How much <laughs> free will do you actually have? Yeah. Or is this determined? Yeah. And you're always going to be this guy. Exactly. So uh, I, I, uh, I, fi- I, as soon as I started realizing that there was this expression going on by the, all these weirdos in rock and roll, I kind of, that's where I went, you know? And those were the, the signifiers, be it Captain Beefheart or, 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 or uh, I was really into l- literature, so I would, I was really into rock writing, you know? And to me, those guys and were, um, as interesting as the musicians they were they were actually writing about, mm-hmm. so writers like Lester Bangs or even Patti Smith, who I knew first as a rock writer before she made a record, um, their personalities, their character, their their intellect was was really um, was amazing to me, and it, and it was had equal value to the people they were writing about in music. So when Patti Smith for, first made her first seven inch and you heard about it being for sale, you'd send away for it. That was really curious to me, like, oh, kind of crossing the line in a way, and you're going, you're, you're actually making a record as, as a rock writer. Do you remember the first and time course, you heard yeah, Piss Factory, like what that felt like? Yeah, I thought yeah. It, it, it just, I remember getting it and thinking, I mean, it was such a cool record because it came in the mail, you know, and it was like a white sleeve, a seven inch, and, you know, it was signed, you know, and... At that time, it just like you didn't know what to think about these kind of things, and but it just sounded so um, it sounded so independent amongst everything that was happening around seventy five, you know, seventy six, and um, I think it came out in seventy five, I guess, and uh, or se- late seventy four or like seventy five when that record came out, and um, I just remember it just sounded like somebody made such a raw statement, like like you here in the in the living room you know it was yeah. like she was like in her living room with her friend Tom Verlaine on guitar and yeah. and just doing this recitation in the microphone and then making a, a, a seven inch vinyl and then selling it to people who might be interested right. who would be reading the same rock and roll magazine that she she was writing for and of course one thing led to the other and she's become Patti Smith this right. iconic person in our lives but at that time you didn't really sort of think about the future it was all really sort of in the present, and that was such a shocking document. And then uh, you started seeing other things happening around that scene in New York. Yeah, with the with the exception of what Stooges were doing, and maybe somebody, some of the the Seeds or Standells West Coast, there was no punk rock yeah, d- defined yeah. as such. And then right, that yeah. that record comes out, and you're yeah. like, oh, there's something completely different happening here. I mean, the Stooges, the Seeds, MC5. I mean, these things were all, or Velvet Underground. Yeah. I mean, they're all precursors, and they all sort of. I mean, they they inform a lot of the. Um, the vibe of punk rock, but punk rock really sort of, I mean, comes into its, it, it's really a, of its moment at that time, like yeah. it's necessary. And it really um, is a, uh, it it really was a, a place for people like us to go to, where we, we felt like um, it was our voice. So when you go into studios now, or in living rooms now, and you're going to make records, are you... Are those days still in your mind? Are you shunning those days? Are you pushing yourself in different directions? No, those days completely define me. But I think for anybody in their lives, I mean, it's like what you experience in your late teens and your early 20s, that, that is, that's always going to be, for the most part, the most important thing in your life. It's like the things that attract you, the things that you sort of align yourself with at that age. Um, that's always going to be the one of the most important things for you. I mean, it's like cause there, it's like it's that initial epiphany of like what you want to be involved with. So you'll always go back to that, and that'll always be uh, this thing that you share with other people who had like-minded experiences or the same age as you or whatever. So when I meet people my age, I'm I'm you know I'm hitting 59 this month. Um, yeah, we can we we always sort of yeah. It's, it's like that's something you never tire relating to like what was happening to you around that time because it informs everything for the rest of your life for the and most you, part. And you, were, how, you have so much history with that now and how, so much time to reflect on it that when you want to make a record now mm. um, you can do things that you wouldn't have been able to do that yeah i'm not I don't, i'm not really interested in replicating it so much um but i i like sort of um honoring it without being nostalgic about it right. and um 
and I know how how interesting and curious it is to people who who, who didn't experience it, who weren't there, you know. And so, I, and I have no, obviously, no problem talking about okay. it. <laughs> I think it's but important, we, man. You got to pass that down. <laughs> I mean, when I go into the studio, I mean, it's it's not like I want to sort of um, do anything except for just really be be contemporary for who I am as, you know, as, as a 59 year old in, you know, 2017. But you still got to work in a studio that had the Pink Floyd board. Didn't have oh yeah. Pink- well, we were, this, like this last record rock and roll consciousness. I mean, we recorded, yeah, we recorded through this, these two analog control boards. One was the stones emotional rescue board. And the other one was this Pink Floyd board that, um, Paul Epworth, the, the studio producer, has uh, there at the church, which is in North London. Now, Paul, this is Paul Adele. Paul worked with Adele, right? And how? Oh, yeah, Paul. You know, yeah, he, yeah, he's well. He's he's definitely known for his his work with Adele Records and uh, yeah, Rihanna and Florence and the Machine. And, and did you know him well before? No, not at all. I mean, I I I, I wasn't really a, a, a aware of who he was at all. I mean, he, he came into my purview through talking to Mark Stewart of the pop group. Um, and, he, and they had just done a record with him called citizen zombie. And I was kind of curious what studios were around, uh, for this project. And he said, Oh, you should check the studio out. And then he started telling me about who Paul Epworth was and what the studio was. And I said, well, that's curious. I mean, why, um, why would you want to work with a producer who has that pedigree? And he says, well, he's from Bristol, which is where we're from. He's a Bristol boy. And he really, you know, he, he came up uh, listening to our music and he's he's really into um, more avant-garde kind of wild stuff. And you might want to give him a call. He's probably completely aware of Sonic Youth and your, your world. And I said, okay. I called him up and then he was really, really welcoming. And I went over to the studio and uh, he showed me around it. And it was in an old church. It was a cathedral. And I knew right away that doing a record called Rock and Roll Consciousness needed to be done in this cathedral. <laughs> and uh, and he was great. And we found out we had the same birthday. Um, Just the 25th? Not the same year, but no, the, same yeah. year. <laughs> the same day. And uh, yeah, and he, he was just, he was great. And he, I think he realized immediately that I wasn't going in there looking for um, like any kind of co-arrangement, you know, or songwriting. But help. that's what he's normally done, right? I think he does that yeah. for sure. Yeah, and he's he's known for that. Um, he uh, he, what he did is allowed me to work in like a in one of the most you know high functioning rooms I've ever been in, um, and he and he was consistently. Um, attentive to how things were sounding at all times. So, can you when you listen back, can you hear him on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically the, how he was really focused on Steve Shelley's drums and how they were being mic'd in the room, which is the mo- kind of the most important thing in the, any studio is like accomplishing a a a good drum sound. Mm-hmm. Guitar amps a little easier. Um, in almost any studio. I was watching I mean, that Dre show, that Dr. Dre show, and he's obsessing over the sound of a snare. Yeah. And that's the thing yeah. that drives everything for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's really true. I mean, it's like, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's to the point of like, when you have a band, make sure the drummer is like happening because that will make your band. You know, it really will. And it doesn't matter how primal the drummer is. I mean, like when I first saw the cramps, Miriam Leno was playing drums, and she was extremely primal as a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody else could have been that cool in that band, you know. I always remember that. It was like a really early gig, and for me, drummers were like, you know, the guys in Yes or ELP or something, you know. <laughs> and this woman was just like playing like boom, boom, ba, ba, boom, boom on every song, and she would just, you know, with cat eye glasses and like a sneer. And I was just like, okay. And it's like, <laughs> it was incredible. And at the end of their set, she got up and, you know, they weren't really well known yet. They didn't have a, a seven inch out yet. And somebody is at Max's Kansas City and somebody yelled out, drum solo. And she just like picked up her drumsticks and opened up her leopard skin pocketbook and dropped them in and snapped it shut and walked off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm gonna throw all my yes records away. <laughs> you, you fucking win. Uh, you win. <laughs> uh, what are you gonna play for us? 
Well, I can play anything for yeah. you except for um, play a new one. Except for uh, um, it, it, I can play a new. I'll yeah. play uh, I'll play a new song from yeah. our record. I'll, yeah. I'll, all the songs are about twenty minutes long. Perfect. But I'll play. I'll, I'll truncate it down to. Uh, Listen, I would know, have, the show is three hours long, <laughs> oh, so I'll carry it? on. <laughs> I'm gonna play a song called "Turn On." Back to the free Godhead. Turn. 
turn it up all the way To hear you come and save the day It's loud and clear, your signal, dear Turn it on and take us out of here Turn it up, we're in the red Bring us back to the free Godhead Thank you so much. That was amazing. Well, thank you. Um, slightly truncated? No. <laughs> oh, what, what do, you, do you find the things you want to say and the things you want to share um, are harder to get out this stage or easier? Oh, oh, um, well, let's see. I don't really, I don't, I don't feel too much anxiety about ex expressing anything. I try to sort of keep it, um, I try to keep some kind of dignity in, in, in lyrics. I, because I've, I, as I look back, you know, through all the lyric writing I, I, I've done since I was a teenager, there's some things that I I, don't, I feel like I could never sort of vocalize again, sing again. Yeah. They're just too, it, well, mostly because they're too corny like as opposed one? to anything. Oh, God, like what song? <laughs> like which one? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, like the first Sonic Youth song was called The Burning Spear that, was rec that I remember singing. And um, God, what are the, the lyrics? Like, I'm not afraid to say I'm scared. In my bed, I'm deep in prayer. I love the speed. I trust the fear. The music comes, the burning spear. Not altogether like you know, corny, but it's just like um, I, you know, I, I don't really. It's not like that's not like something I feel like I would write right now. Maybe I am writing the same thing, but just in <laughs> in a classier way, <laughs> like in more of a you know, in a middle aged way, possibly. I don't know. Um, but you know, it's funny because uh, when that first record came out like in 80, 81. And um, when it, somebody had reviewed it somewhere in some fanzine or something. And they said like, wow, these lyrics are really, um, like why would anybody want to sing something where it's like, I I love to take speed, I love to drink beer. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm not singing that. You know, but it's like, that always stuck with me. It's like, oh, is that what they're hearing? It's yeah. just like, yeah, I love to take speed, I love to drink beer. And it's just like, when it's something, you know, else entirely like, and so that was always, you know, that I think right after that it was just like, can we have lyric sheets in our records, please? You know? So people don't. Think that. But still, you would do records, and you know, they would go to uh, get, they would go to reviewers without lyric sheets, and they would still get it wrong. mishear the lyrics, and then and then critique the songs by hearing these lyrics that were wrong. And I, I didn't know what to think about that because a lot of the times it wouldn't be infuriating. Yeah, it's fucking bullshit, man. If you're gonna yeah, hate, it's like gonna... I didn't sing that. I mean, I understand why you would critique that because it's like it's a horrible lyric, but I didn't write it. Um, but I, 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 I always remember like mishearing lyrics from songs, and that would inspire me to write lyrics. There's a Black Flag song um, called "Rise Above," yeah. which is great. It's for a song on on Damaged, yeah. and uh, and the lyrics um, are. You know, um, Keith sang it, right? No, Henry yeah, sings Henry. it. I mean, Keith sang yeah, it, yeah. and Henry sang yeah. it. But it was like, uh, this, there's this lyric that's like, society's arms of control, rise above. We're gonna... But I always thought he was like, you know, he was uh, singing like, um, society is a whole, you know, yeah. like society is a whole. Like, I was like, but I was mishearing it. Right. And so I wrote that down. And there's a song on, our Sonic Youth record, Bad Moon Rising, called Society as a Whole, where I actually was like, that was the startup point. Right. And so... Um, but that's a good miss here. It's a, it, well, it's a good miss here. Yeah. But I like, I mean, so, 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 you know, for me, it was always interesting in rock and roll because it, it's, um, the criticism of it early on certainly was just like, well, you can't understand the lyrics. Like, what, you know, what's Mick Jagger singing? You know, what's Louie Louie? What are the lyrics? You know? And so there's always this, like, you know, this game of just trying to decipher rock and roll lyrics sometimes. And then you start getting these more 
articulate singer. Certainly Bob Dylan was very, had yeah. a lot of good articulation. I always liked Lou Reed because he, he always really articulated his singing because he wanted people to hear his words. And he slowed you know, it down, as, as right? Well. Yeah, he really wanted that. To, that was very important to him, and rightly so. And But I think for somebody like, say, say Mick Jagger or whatever, he's just like, no, it's about, it's it's primarily the, the emotion of the voice, is the sound. Remember, that's his instrument. What was it about so Free Sonic Youth? For me, it was all, it was, it was primarily um, about literature. And so I was more in the Lou Reed camp than possibly the, you know, the Mick Jagger camp. Cause I, but it was musically, also, it was very much in the other way. Well, <laughs> like artistically in a feel yeah. and expression, right? I, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we came out, we didn't come out of any kind of real um, academy of, of music, you know. I mean, Sonic Youth is a, a band of like visual artists and, and just, you know, people coming in there, you know, you know, wanting to write our own rules from the ground up, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And we weren't the only band like that, but that's sort of what our milieu was. You know? And you still do that now? <laughs> yes. You still feel that way? <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it, with the group I have now, I mean, I have Deb Googe from My Bloody Valentine playing bass, and she's just so wonderful. And when she locks in with Steve Shelley, who's just like such a formidable drummer, um, you know, that's for me is like this really gracious thing. Like I can actually have these people playing music with me. The guitarist James Sedwards from London who's plays with lots of different groups. Um, to have him in my group actually just he's such a um he's such a high technique player as far as like mm -hmm. rock and roll. He goes from like Jimmy Page to the fall, you know, or whatever. Um these real extremes like from you know, from Lydia Lunch to you know it's, to Roger Waters, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. these are really extremes. He's that, he, and that's what that's like. Oh, I want you to play guitar. My and yeah, and, you're, and Sonic Youth players were players, but it's a different. Well, Sonic Youth is different because we got together at such a young age, and it didn't matter like how uh, advanced you were or not advanced. It didn't matter. It was just all about it was it was all about like-minded people getting together and then plugging in and seeing what happens, and then having that progress and develop and becoming this group, this group like a group yeah. mind thing. And that's something again, like like I said earlier, it's like you can't replicate d that. You don't, and you don't really want to. Yeah. You know, it's like it, then you, you become like sort of like, you know, like an uh, like an eighty year old in a miniskirt. You like you don't want to do that. And so I um. I, I, feel like it's, really, amazing to be able to sort of get musicians together who had all this experience and be able to sort of have a band that um, has already been through the wars, more or less, you know? Do you ever have to deal with, maybe obviously not with Steve, but deal with a thing where, hey, this is Thurston's band and Thurston wants to make music for them oh, to do I ever, do, do we have they, that dynamic? Yeah, that's a little bit. and they have to get past the fact that you're in Sonic Youth. And, oh, and no, there's no, a I mean, I think it's understood. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's... It, it's my name on the cover of the record, and it's like you know, it's my name in the in, on the publishing. It's my name on the marquee. But do they think you want something, and you want them to do something different? No, because I, you know, what it is, it's like they know that I wanted them in this group because of their expertise, yeah. and that's and that's what it's all about. I don't, I don't, I certainly don't notate what anybody plays, um, and I'm not really a. Um, I'm not a megalomaniac. It's not like you, you, you know, it's my way or the highway. I'm very, the reason they're playing in, in this group is because I want them to play as to the best of their abilities, which I know are great. Mm -hmm. So I, I would never tell Steve Shelley like how to play the drums, you know, right. those, that's his, that's what he does. And it's like, um, and that's what, that's why he's he's in the group because he's he's so good and plus I mean and plus Steve and I have like um, we have ESP I mean we've been playing together since the mid '80s right. and he was really young when he joined Sonic Youth and he had already toured with some different like bands mostly like punk rock and hardcore bands and stuff like that. Um, a lot of that era too was about it was about being about something. Yeah. I, I remember seeing you play at the Tibetan Freedom concerts and that like the, this is an incredible era right now politically socially for people to step up. Yeah. Um, are you seeing it the way you wanted to see it? Do you think the artists are representing themselves in a way that you are comfortable with? 
I, well, I think uh, well, I think every artist has their own uh, right to make their own decisions about how they want to present themselves uh, as public figures. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I think you have this um, privilege of being in a situation where you can engage in in society and be um, and be a model of uh, of some dignity, and I, you know, I mean, with Sonic Youth, it was like I realized after some years in the group that that's what we were representing to a lot of people. It wasn't had nothing to do with money, mm -hmm. had nothing to do with um, the standards of success in the industry. It had a lot to do with how we um, presented ourselves as far as creative decisions, what we were what we were doing musically that wasn't really um, towing the line of, uh, you know, what was, what was hip or on, on sale at that time. And, um, and I still see that as something that was like completely appreciated, you know, by people who were listening. And so every day, you know, something will happen, especially days when I'm feeling kind of a little disconnected, maybe a little sort of, um, lost in the world, and somebody will just come out of a, a delicatessen, a businessman yeah. or somebody, and just go, like, oh, hey, hey, I just want to tell you that your music really helped me through some really tough times in my life, and thank you for that, or, you know, thank you for this or that. And that just, that's it. You know, that has so much, that's so much more important than um, anything else, yeah. you know. <clears throat> yeah, big money, bank, awards, yeah. whatever that is. <laughs> That's stuff I've never seen. <laughs> I mean, you know guys who've had it, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that's... Uh, no, but I mean, it's it, so cool. You know, it's just like, it's like, and I really, I mean, I'm just, I mean, that's such a gracious thing. I'm just, I'm just like, that just, it, it, and it continues to blow my mind. Have you done that to somebody? Thank them? Yeah, yeah. I have, yeah. yeah. But I also, I mean, you know, I, I'm very sensitive to boundary issues in those situations because I know what I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you play a gig and it's like all your friends and family are there, and and uh, you know, they kind of they want to sort of talk to you, and they kind of you know they're kind of cool. They wait, yeah. but you have to like. It's like the ones who have boundary issues, who are like the freaks who you don't know, who are just like ah, and they're just like kind of like a wall, and just like I want to really want to talk to the like, yeah. <laughs> my family friends. Um, but that's, you know, just the way it is. Okay, and, you know, and I love, you know, I love freaks. So it's just like, you know, yeah. it's like, that's, but I, I, when I go to a concert or see something, I, 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 like, I don't want to be that person who's like the first one. But have you ever been you that know, guy? Like crashing through the dressing room door. Like, Hey, <laughs> um, have I ever done that? Yeah. I remember, um, going to New York as a teenager to see certain things and, and going to, I remember Patti Smith playing like at a fairly large venue there on New Year's Eve or something, and, and I remember like going to the back and there's a bunch of people hanging out waiting for her to come out. I was like, oh, maybe I'll hang out with these people and wait to, you know, wait. And she came out, and uh, I was like, now what do I do? I was like, everybody <laughs> ran to her and I was trying to get autographs, and I was like, oh. And then I just sort of stood there and it was kind of raining out, and I was just like, well, I don't really want to like, you know do that and then as she she was with she was like walking holding hands with Todd Rundgren which was all the cooler you know yeah. like you know and uh <laughs> of course she was yeah yeah of course <laughs> and they were getting into a black car and I was like oh okay and then right when she was getting in the car she saw me standing by myself I always remember this and she just sort of stopped and gave me a moment gave me a second just looked at me it's like okay and then got in the car and uh I became friendly with her many, many years later, and I actually yeah. mentioned this to her. Of course, she, she, you know, they meant, she, I don't think she no. <laughs> recall this, but I will always remember it. As you, you know, should. So, you know, you want to play something else for us? Uh, I'll play a song. Um, you know, the first time the band got together was about uh, almost four plus years ago yeah. in, in, in London. And uh, I got together with James, a guitar player, and then Debbie came in, and then Steve came in, and then we were four-piece. And we didn't really play together, really, as a four-piece until we rolled tape on that first record. So that first record is kind of baby steps. Rock and roll consciousness, we're, we're, we're real. You proved we're, that. We're, we're there. We're here. 
Um, but this is one of the first songs that we, we played together, and it's called Speak to the Wild.
come from those lyrics i was writing you know when i was sort of sort of seeing this advancement of um like ideologies that were presenting fear and paranoia and divisiveness into the culture in order to sort of um create a power base of wealth and money and greed and and you know um which i I saw as being really um, dangerous for uh, f for young people to be coming up in the, uh, contemporary culture with, and that at the same time, sort of seeing young people sort of recognizing, realizing this, and sort of coming together and trying to figure out through historical measures of how to sort of counter something like this because it's mm -hmm. it's so powerful it's all based on power where most people i think who have more kind of liberal socialized uh ideologies don't really care about power they just care about everybody sort of <laughs> sharing the land you know? yeah so it doesn't have to, anything to do with this kind of uh um you saw the lead this up kind of selfish kind of agenda but so but in a way so that that, that that's you know that's something that's been going on in human history since day one. So we always have this in our world. But when I see it now in contemporary times, especially how explicit it is, especially in the USA, and then what's, what's been going on in the UK to some degree, and then lots of um, situations across Europe and, and then f further abroad, it becomes even more extreme sometimes. It, it's, always a, it's, it's always a struggle. And I always find this kind of honor in opposition. There's a, there's a lot of honor in that struggle. And so... I wrote this song thinking about, um, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter who's in her early 20s living in the USA, and I think about um, that. It's like, I, I just, you know, I, I want her to be safe, and I think safety is really important. And so when I, coming from the USA where there's, there's like a, an open gun culture, I find it really reprehensible. And wasn't, was it your studio that was shut down after 9-11? Like, oh, uh, yeah. Our studio was on, covered, on, right? on Murray Street, and, yeah. uh, it, which was like in the hood of, yeah, of, of the World Trade Center. Yeah, it got, it got um, completely, uh, not completely demolished, but it, was, it certainly was, it certainly we couldn't um, access it for weeks. Right. You know. your, yeah. your daughter is about the age now that you were when you started Sonic Youth, isn't she? Why? Is your daughter roughly around the age that you were when Sonic Youth happened? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really, it's really. She's just twenty three right now, and she's living in Brooklyn yeah. uh, with two friends, and they, um, and she's in, engaging in the world in, in her life, and you know, it's 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 a situation like when I was that age, and I was also in New York, and every once in a while I would call my mother, and she'd say like, oh. You know, um, it's, nice to hear, it's nice to hear that you're alive. <laughs> um, you know, at some point in time, you will have a child, and it will, that child will grow up, and that child will maybe will call you once in a while, and you'll and you, <laughs> you'll, and that's your life and you'll feel my pain. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's absolutely correct. <laughs> it's like you were, you, you know, you 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 think about this person every day because it's the most important thing in your life, and but you have to trust their their uh, that they're. Um, they're grown up. There's a, you know, I remember reading an interview with Robert Thurman, who's a Buddhist scholar, and his daughter Uma Thurman, the actress, right? And he was, they were asking him about her, and he's like, well, you know, at some point, all we can do is like, we're we're guides, and we can only sort of like be there, and then you have to, they have to go. And we went, they go too. You know, it's like you just have to be there, though. Yeah, you have to be present. You, you don't have to be, a, which is just the opposite of you know, you can be present. But you don't have to be a helicopter parent, <laughs> right? <laughs> of which you are not. Was she on the road with you and came? Oh yeah, yeah. She grew yeah? up on the road. Yeah. yeah. She was. She would grow up on the road and toured with all the time. And uh, you know, I remember we were playing somewhere. 
we we were actually on the David Letterman show once, and and she was really just still a, a child. And uh, John Waters was on the show, and yeah. I was talking to John Waters, and, and he was, and I was like, yeah, she kind of like she's she tours with us everywhere. And he looked at her, and he's like, born in a trunk. <laughs> 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 Which is just like, it was right, you know, yeah. John, only John Waters would have that great, like, romantic perception of just like, yeah, the life on know. the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you and your daughter close? Like, do you, uh, yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, being- she's, she's, she's really special. And she's, she's a wonderful visual artist. And yeah. she's had, when she was a teenager, she had a couple of bands that were really, really amazing. And it really, um, the, the, the last one she had, which was called Big Nils in ILS, um, was really cool and I'm, when they first started I, I remember she was in the basement with them and they were making a a racket a bunch of noise they and uh she came upstairs and said like you know noise is only good if you're the one making it because <laughs> she would see me making noise right. with other like noise people and just go like oh my god what is this but then For she her. realized like oh it's actually when you're making it it's fantastic and uh, I thought that was an interesting perception. I can imagine. Did, did I read correctly that you never thought Sonic Youth was over? But you got you well. Really- I mean, Sonic Youth to me was something I, you know, I mean, it, it's a name I came up with, and and this group was always something that I felt was. I mean, it's it was. I felt so so much of a personal identity with, and I still do. I mean, Sonic Youth never really. Um, you know, there was no of, of official statement of Sonic Youth, right. you know, declaring. Uh, I mean, you got the villain paintbrush on you for sure, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, you know, it's it's uh, to me, it it lives forever. You know, and it's like I have Sonic Life tattooed on my on my arm from from the mid eighties. Do you have songs in your head or in your on your? Well, I write. I mean, I you know, even with you know with Sonic, it to me, it's like. Sonic Youth was a forum, and it was a forum of four people, and yeah. that's sort of what that work was. And it was it was really group group playing. And regardless of who came in with whatever structures or compositions or lyrics, or whatever, it went into the group mind, and it and it, be, and it became what it became. Each each song, whatever, and it was like there was a lot of dynamic in there with that. Um, and you know that was for me as a as, as a group. Um, I had that as an experience for well on 30 years yeah. most groups don't last beyond three years you know so and that, yeah. so i feel like um i don't, it's not something i really sort of desire to sort of have so much anymore is that that kind of um that kind of interaction i feel like i, I it's um I, I i feel like i've spent well enough time in that kind of situation and i really enjoy actually now sort of um being the the one in charge yeah you know, and not not for any sense of ego, just because it's it's um, I I feel less anxious, and it's more I, you know this is what I want to present. I have my name on it, and and there's also not the family. There's not the family dynamic that you had. There's so many other considerations, yeah. right? In that, yeah, which I can imagine. No, it's it's a completely different thing, yeah. and I so for me, Sonic Youth is such a um, historically for me, it's just like it was beautiful, wonderful experience, and uh, but. Uh, and it never really changed that much. The only thing that was sort of would change is like at some point when Steve Shelley came in, that was like we had a few drummers before that. Um, you know, uh, Bob Burt, who's actually playing in Toronto tonight with Lydia Lunch and her uh, retrovirus group. And, uh, and Steve was in there after Bob, and he was in there for the longest run. Uh, so he became part of the quartet as a, as a solid member after a few years for sure and then you know we had Jim O'Rourke come in and play with us for a while as a bass player and then after he left we had Mark Eibold from Pavement playing bass for a while um, so those were the only really different modifications of group the nucleus was always uh, me, Kim, Lee, Lee and Steve yeah. and that was always it and that was a family that had grown up, and we sort of learned how to play together and work together in different ways. But, uh, oh, God, I mean, it's just like I, I wouldn't want to do that again, you know, starting in, in my 50s. It's like, let's start a band and see what happens. It's like, <laughs> no, I, 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 <laughs> I'd like you to play and you to play and you to play. These are my songs, and this is how they go. 
have your way with them, and let's 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 uh, find some pleasure here, you know. And so that's that's what goes on. For my own satisfaction, the riff or cool thing. Yeah, where that. The riff or cool thing is a riff that I I uh, I had for a couple of years. I used to, I, you know, I, I distinctly remember being on tour in Europe and being in Stockholm and being in the dressing room, and I kept sort of playing that riff. And the guy who was doing our our front of house sound at the at the time, Terry Pearson, who we had met, I, mean, I, I know all these details, <laughs> who we had met in Austin, Texas, uh, and he was touring with us. And I remember him sitting there. He goes like. Oh, that's pretty good, yeah. you know. Like you should keep trying to, and I kept trying to work something out with it, and I did. And then, was so, it the same one? Were you, were you were playing for him? Was it the one that ended yeah. up on the record? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. And so um, I knew that it had to be, uh, it had to be a song. And so I think the next time we got into rehearsals, it was just like, dun, 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 this, this, and this, and then it became what it became. Yeah. And then Chuck D shows up on the record. Well, when we went to studio, I mean. Uh, Kim wrote the lyrics that were sort of inspired by um, a interview she had done with LL Cool J when he was just coming up for uh, Spin Magazine. An interview that didn't go well, right? I think it went okay. I don't. I don't remember it being too contentious or anything like that. But I remember it. It, it, it had this. Um, it, it triggered something for her uh, inspiration. Her inspiration to write these lyrics. Let's put it that way. And, and that was it. And so when we were doing it, the song was certainly in reference to like uh, this hip hop musician from New York. And as it had happened, we were recording in a studio where Public Enemy was right next door recording It Takes a Nation of Millions. Mm -hmm. And um, he says casually as one of the great records of all time. Yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't. Yeah, nobody knew what was coming down the pike yeah. there, and we were doing our record. They were doing their record, and it was, you know, and then you would sit around and watch TV together in the common room, and it's just like, and they were, they were, they were great, and and uh, um, and Nick's uh, Nick Sansano, who was engineering our record when we were doing that song, um, it just sort of came up was like with that that section in the middle that was a bit of a recitation. Uh, of bringing Chuck in to 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 do a, a bit of a back and forth with it, and uh, yeah, we just went out and asked him, mm -hmm. and, and he just he just sort of came in and we said, do you, you know, do you want do you want us to play you the track? He's like, no, I'm good, and uh, <laughs> it's like, well, okay, well, you should listen to like the part that you're gonna do, right? He's like, yeah, 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 just you know, put me in front of the microphone, <laughs> and he stood there, and. Um, I think what we kind of rolled to that section, we said, well, this is the section where it is. And he's like, hey, hey, cool, just let it, let it go. And as soon as he heard, you know, like, you know, hey, cool thing, what are you going to do for, you know, um, fear of a female planet? And I think that's where what brought it on. It was like that line, fear of a female planet, because it, it was fear of a black planet was being recorded, actually. That's what it was. Fear of a black planet was being recorded in the next room. So we knew that that was titled. So to say fear of a female planet, that sort of was like, oh, let's bring Chuck in and see if you... And he responded to it, and it was complete first take. Amazing. He, and it was just like this, his voice was just like this rich honey on the microphone, yeah. And, uh, and we just sat there and like, whoa. It was like, he's, he's got the goods. And um, yeah, it was, it was complete first take. That's the one thing that might be missing from all the home recording and studio and, and the evolution of technology is that so many artists I've interviewed from that era have had those moments in a studio yeah. where they've met somebody else in another band and it's yeah, been yeah. really enriching for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You wanna, well, you can still have it. Yeah. But, you know, we have options now, That's true. Obviously. You want to you <laughs> close with a cover for us? You I'll play you're a cover. Really a covers you know, band, right? No, well, no I, you know, to me it's just like um, playing covers is something I've never really did. And I, I know so many musicians who came up learning how to play by being in cover bands or playing covers. You know, Mike Watt in the Minuteman, he's like he said him and D Boone, they used to just like jam Blue Oyster Cult eight tracks into the into the bedroom player and they would sit there and they would just like learn the songs, you know, and they learned how to play Credence Clearwater and all this stuff. So he could play all these things. I was like, God, I never did that. Yeah. I mean I might have sort of figured out how to play like the uh, the beginning of Smoke on the Water or the yeah. beginning of something else. But I would just like <laughs> stop after the beginning. I would stop. I was like, I don't want to learn the rest of it. So, like, I just, I kind of want to do That's my own thing. That's the cool thing. part. So, All right. 
<laughs> I have the lyrics here to this song called um, Psycho Mafia by The Fall. I'm going to put my, uh, I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can read them. Um, I can read them like this. Um, and uh, Sonic Youth had covered this song on a Peel session, John Peel. And uh, we, did a, we did a few Peel sessions, and one of them was uh, we covered all songs by The Fall. And uh, which is, you know, a band from New York City covering songs by a band from Manchester was kind of perverse. Um, but we did it. And, uh, and that was quite a while ago. And, and I always remember doing this song and like, like doing it. It's called Psycho Mafia. It was a seven inch from the, uh, I don't know, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And I'm, I'll try to do it justice. song by um, a, a Toronto punk band from yeah. this period and I was listening to them because I, I love those songs and uh, but I would I um, I couldn't I couldn't figure out the, the lyrics and a lot of the lyrics don't <laughs> exist online there's a song by the government I wanted yeah. to do you know this band I do yeah 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 and uh, I wanted song? It, the one called angles like ang <laughs> I have there's a song too, about yeah. angles <laughs> <laughs> but then you'd and have to learn a, and there's a song the by the poles remember yeah. the poles I know the poles yeah and they had a song called CN Tower yeah um, and I used to see the polls because they would come down to New York and play way at, before at, Drake, by the way, CBGB repping that tower. Oh yeah, yeah, way before Drake repping the tower. I don't know if Drake, I don't know if Drake was uh, even out of the shoot yet at that point. <laughs> um, but uh, the polls were good, and they and they they would come down and play CBGBs, and they would be on these bills, and like the polls from Toronto, um, and they would sing this song called CN Tower, but nobody in New York knew what CN Tower was. So I didn't know what that was either. Yeah. It was just like, was so it, it you know, and the, you know. It was and, also uh, brand new. It had just been built. Oh, okay. The they, tower that's had what, yeah. Just been I knew built. something was going on. Yeah. And then there was this group called the B Girls, mm -hmm. and they used to come down and play. And they used to, and mm -hmm. I remember the B Girls coming out on stage dressed in their pajamas, you know, and, and then one of the girls was dating Stiv Bader's from the Dead Boys. It was all very romantic. As it should be. And they would talk about this. This club up here is called Crash and Burn or something like that, right? It was that closed they, before my time, yeah. It was before your time. Yeah. And there's a band called The Vile Tones that yeah. everybody was really interested in. Then. The Vile Tones came down and played, but I didn't see them. I wish I did. Well, that, in that era, Toronto was a really big punk scene. Had a really yeah, big Yeah, yeah, really scene. cool bands. And, you know, the Diodes yeah. and, 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 uh, and I, I really, like, uh, was thinking that maybe I should come here and do, like, a, um, covers of, like, classic Toronto 
punk bands. Next time you're in but, town, come in with the band. I'll work on it. And we'll do a full set of it. I'll come with the band yeah. and we'll do like a Toronto punk set. Yeah, and we'll pack the house and it'll be fun. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Awesome. Thanks, Thurston. It's a date. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Always, sure. Thank you.